Hi there and welcome to our online service. We're trusting that you'll be encouraged and uplifted by today's message. Yes, and if this is your first time joining us, then an extra special welcome to you. We'd love to direct you to our website where you can access our online visitors brochure, which will give you some great information about our church. And we also hope to see you soon at one of our services in the church building. All our service times are available on the church website and our social media platforms will keep you updated with everything happening in the life of church. Then just a reminder that if you have any prayer requests, you can contact us via the email address on screen. Our team would love to connect with you and pray for your needs. Yes, and giving to God is one of our values at Rivers Church, and we'd encourage you to use one of our electronic means available to give your tithes and offerings to God through the local church. In Malachi 3 verse 10, it says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there'll be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I'll pour out a blessing so great, you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it, put me to the test. Our giving builds the church and enables us to do what God has called us to do, to reach and influence people for Jesus. And God promises to pour out His blessing over our lives when we give out of obedience with a heart for the kingdom. Well, we hope you're ready for today's message. Let's lean in and be encouraged. Hi Church, this Easter, the Rivers Foundation is looking forward to putting a smile on our beneficiary children's faces by adding a treat of chocolate marshmallow Easter eggs to their meals. We would love your help. You can bring in boxes of Beacon's original milk chocolate marshmallow eggs like this and drop it off at the Foundation stand. Together, let's make this Easter special for our beneficiary children. Well, it's so good to be in church this morning. It's so good to be in Durban. Like Pastor Dean said, I'm all the way from our Sandton campus. And um, every time I come to Durban, it just gets prettier and prettier and prettier. And I'm not just saying that. I promise. When I was younger, I didn't like coming to Durban. But the older I got, not that I'm old, <laughs> the more I've enjoyed it. And it's such a beautiful place that Pastor Dean always calls the promised land. And it's beginning to make sense. Well, we're going to get straight into the Word, but before we do that, we're going to pray and we're going to commit uh, the service, the message to God. We're not praying because I'm kind of like feeling my way through it. We're praying because we're going to trust that the Holy Spirit would speak to us. Because a message won't change your life. It's only the Holy Spirit that can come in and can change our hearts and change the situation and changes us. So what we're going to do is we're going to pray. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit in and uh, we're going to trust God today. Do you feel comfortable? Why don't you raise your hands as we pray? It's an attitude of surrender. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are 
uh, that we're here by design, Father God. Thank you that we're not here by accident, but you've got a plan and purpose for every single person here today. And as we go into your word, as you look at the truth of the word, Father, I pray that you would speak through me and you'd use me, but your Holy Spirit would speak to the hearts of the individuals that are here today, that you'd speak to our situations, that you'd change our lives so that by the end of the service, lives would be changed, people would come to know you, and we'd leave the service better than when we walked in. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. You can take your seats. You know, I can't believe it's been over two years since we've been in a lockdown. Do you remember when we thought it was going to be five weeks? All we needed was extra toilet paper and we would have been okay. And now nearly two years later, we're still in a pandemic, but it is getting better. You know, my brother got married in December and it was great to finally see some family from overseas again. In the evening service, I said, my family from Asia. I have no family in Asia, although I probably do. Um, but it was so great to have our, our family here. But when you're around family from overseas, we've got our family from London and, and Australia, you realize just how South African you are. Let me give you an example. We, um, we recently moved into our new apartment, my wife and I, and my family was there. And I just said, hey, could you please pass the sunlight? Now, let me give you context. We have, a, we have a, a window in our kitchen. So the person kind of walks into the kitchen, looks around, and he's like looking out the window. I'm like, what are you doing looking out the window? It's during the day, by the way. And I said, it's there by the window. <laughs> like, I can see it. How do I get it to you? I'm like, just carry it. <laughs> Turns out sunlight is actually a brand. And it's not what we call dishwashing liquid. Um, Another example is anybody um, own a pool, seen a pool, swam in a pool? See their hand? Heard rumors about pools? (laughs) Now, in the picture over here, there's a little blue thing. What's that called? You know that you're wrong in a nice way. Creepy Crawly is the brand. It's not the actual device. I think it's called a pool cleaner. I don't know, actually. I should have probably known that before I spoke about it. But it's not just South Africans that do this. It's overseas people can do this. And not even just naming something that it's not, but using things that it wasn't originally designed for. Let me give you an example. Many of us would remember when we had outlines and church had the free pens. (laughs) Just look down. Don't look ahead. It's a safe space. You know, you'd accidentally take them home and you'd accidentally use them in the week and you were always meant to remember to bring them back. You didn't. Well, at the pen lid, like the picture behind me, there's a hole at the top. And I was younger, I always thought, why would they have a hole at the top? Won't it dry the ink out? Well, the reason is that if a child or a a 30-something-year-old child would swallow it, it wouldn't stop them from breathing. It creates a passageway of air so you could get it removed and you wouldn't choke to death. So it's less of a choking hazard. Now, please don't try this at home. (laughs) But it's interesting, right? I'll give you another example. Anybody own a pair of jeans? Wearing jeans? Heard rumors of jeans? You know you have a change pocket. You put like your coins in there, sometimes your car keys, or if you have a tag for the office or the gym, you'd put it in there. Did you know that's not what it was originally designed for? The change pocket was actually meant for pocket watches back in the day. Because pocket watches, they weren't wrist watches. You'd have to have a pocket watch. And if you were working, you'd need to know what the time is. So you'd pull it out of your pocket and put it back. We now use it as a change pocket. Seems like, I'm not saying you can't use it as a change pocket. You don't have to go buy a pocket watch. Um, and then the last example is one of my favorites. Everybody know, anybody seen a beanie with a pom-pom on the top? It's like the picture behind me. Do you know who designed the pom-pom on a beanie? Not Gucci. Somebody said. (laughs) It was the military. You see, what would happen is when they were in cold climates, they would put a beanie on, and then they would have the pom-pom, because when they were in a truck, and if if, when they were in a truck, they needed to stay warm, or a tank, but if they came under attack, or they needed to move quickly, the soldiers would get up with enthusiasm, and then get down with enthusiasm. So what it was designed to do was create a a barrier of protection so that they didn't hurt their head. Now you and I use it for fashion items and it's great. And you see, I'm giving you these examples to illustrate a point. 
What if we've taken God's word, the gospel and salvation, and we've been calling it something it's not or using it for not what it was intended for? Today, we're gonna go back to the basics and we're gonna take a look at what the gospel should result in in our lives. When we get saved, we didn't just get saved so that we can come to church and tick Christian on a form at home affairs. God's got a plan and a purpose for Christianity and a plan and purpose for the gospel. The title of the message is this, The Gospel Equals. We're gonna take a look at what the gospel should result in in our lives and in our families and not just on Sundays, but in our, in our lives in, in all. And as we go into this, I'm only gonna take a look at, at, at three small points. It's like a, like a back to basics message, if you wanna call it that. But as you study God's word, as you get deeper into God's word, what you'll understand is you'll see the, like Pastor, Pastor Dean spoke on last week, the life transforming power of the word. As we have our quiet times, we'll get to delve deeper and look at more areas, but we're gonna take an, an overview of what the gospel should result in in our lives. And the gospel is this, it's the good news. It's not just the first four, Four gospels, uh, first four books of the New Testament. It's actually the good news that Jesus came. He paid the price for our sin. And because of what he did, we have salvation, we have grace, and we can live our lives as born again Christians and as a new creation. And as we look at what the gospel should result in, we're gonna take a look at a scripture found in Colossians. It's in Colossians 1, verses three onwards. And it says this, we always thank God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all God's people, the faith and the love that springs up from the hope stored up for you in heaven and about which you have already heard the true message of the gospel that has come to you. Can we pause there? Notice it doesn't just say a gospel, it's the gospel. And not just the gospel, but the true message of the gospel. It's important that as Christians, we have a balanced understanding of scripture and the gospel. We can't rely too heavily on grace or on the law. We have to find balance. And when you look at what the true meaning of the gospel is, as we equip ourselves, verse six goes on to say, um, goes on to say this, that has come to you in the same way the gospel is bearing fruit. Everyone say bearing fruit. Everyone say growing. Bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. We continually ask God to fool you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy and please him in every way, bearing fruit. Everyone say bearing fruit. In every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. Everyone say growing. The title of your message is the gospel equals, and the first point is this, the gospel equals fruit. And as you write that down, don't think bananas and grapes and pineapples. Uh, we need to look at what fruit actually means, and uh, fruit should be like the visible life change in our lives. The Bible says that we are born again. We're not updated. It's not like our lives are not an app on an app store. When we became, when we became Christian, the icon changed and there was a couple updates. Actually, you're born again. You made a new creation. God wants to do a new work in us. And the fruit of that is what we're going to look at today. And you know, the result of the gospel, the good news is that we bear fruit. But it's always been, God, been, it's always been God's plan for you and I. You know that in Genesis, in, one, in Genesis 1.28, we call it the Genesis mandate. It's where God, he commands Adam and Eve this. It says, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. You know, he's speaking to Adam and Eve about having children, but that principle applies in our spiritual life. As Christians, we should always bear fruit. There should always be visible growth in our life, and we should keep trusting God for that. And when we understand that, and we understand that the gospel should equal a fruitful life, well, what does your, your life result in? Can people see that you're a Christian by the way that you live, the way that you, you, you walk, the way that you trust God? Is there something different about your life since you've become a Christian, or does it look exactly the same? We need to make sure that we, we change how we live our lives. Pastor Andre always says this, what you believe will determine how you live. We need to ask ourselves, what do we believe about finances? What do we believe about marriage? What do we believe about God's word? What do we believe about family, and are we living that out? You know, I remember when I was younger, I was born in the 90s, and I grew up in the early 2000s. It comes after the 90s. And uh, there was a particular musician at the time. Uh, I'm not going to mention the person's name. But they had this tattoo on his chest, and it says this, Only God will judge me. Firstly, be careful what you wish for. 
But uh, it was the, the whole theory was this. It's don't judge what I do. I'm, I'm okay with God. You need to judge my heart and my actions. And did you know that that's not true? In fact, Jesus says the opposite. Look what he says in Matthew 7. Matthew 7 verse 20. Just as you can identify a tree by its fruits, you can identify people by their actions. Our actions are the fruit of our life. And what you do is a result of who you are. And who you are is a result of what you do. It's like a cycle. You can't remove one from the other. You can't say you're a Christian but don't behave like it. You need to behave that you're a Christian. And your life should say that you're a Christian, not just your words. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He said, so then, dear friends, these good works must be in the Christian. They are not the root, but the fruit of his salvation. They are not the way of the believer's salvation. They are, the, they are his walk in the way of salvation. You see, it may not be the way that we get salvation is through works, but as a result of salvation, our works should change. Our life should change. We shouldn't just be a Christian because it says so on Instagram. You know, there's people, nobody in the Durban North Campus, obviously. But you go on their Instagram profile, like, I didn't know this person was a Christian. They have a cross in their bio, child of God, maybe a scripture, Jeremiah, it's a good one. And, well, and then you go through their feed and it's like, you know, uh, they have a scripture, it'll say, and, and the Lord clothes me. And you're like, where's your clothes in this picture if God's clothing you? And this is not just for young people because older people can do it as well. We need to be careful of what we post. You, you know, just because you follow every single one of our campuses, all of the pastors, and this pastor from overseas, it doesn't make you a Christian. What makes us a Christian is the way that we live our life according to God's word and we trust him. We need to constantly bear fruit. We need to have the fruit of the spirit in our life. We need to have love and joy and peace and patience. We need to have kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control, not just on Sunday. The fruit of the Spirit isn't like a jacket that you put on. I've got my fruit of the Spirit on now on Sunday. And then when the hospitality volunteer says, please sit here, and you're like, sure, I've got my kindness on. And when there's traffic outside as you get to the parking, I've got my patience on. Well, what happens on Monday to Saturday? Do we have kindness at home? The way we speak to our spouse is the self-control when it comes to uh, our diets, when it comes to being in the office. Do we take the stationery like the church pens? We need to make sure that in all areas of our lives that we are applying the principles of God. What happens when we're in traffic? Is there patience? What happens when you've got a home affairs? Or the licensing department? Or we get pulled over? Is there kindness? Is there joy? Is there peace? When we speak about our country, the fruit of the Spirit should be evident in all areas of our life, not just in some areas. And we need to make sure that we are bearing fruit all the time because you can't fake fruit. Jesus says this in Matthew 7, Matthew 7 verses 16. It says, you can identify them by their fruit. That is by the way they act. Can you pick grapes from a thorn bush or figs from a thistle? A good tree produces good fruit. Everyone say good fruit. And a bad tree produces? A good tree can't produce? And a bad tree can't produce? Some of you are like, okay, we get the point. Well, make sure that we understand that because good fruit comes from a good seed and the gospel is a good seed. Therefore, we should be producing good fruit in our life. Not perfect fruit, good fruit. And as we navigate life, we need to make sure that we are always producing good fruit. As a society, though, we are a society that's so focused on image. It's kind of like we look at leaves and we neglect fruit. Oh, that tree looks full, but is there fruit in it? Oh, wow, look at how tall that tree is. Look at how big it is, but is there fruit on that tree? When it comes to our relationships, and we, is there fruit in it or is it just leaves? When, we wanna, uh, when we're looking for a job and we want to sign up with a com- company, do we say, oh, look, at this is the salary package? Or say, what's the morals of the company? What's the values of this company? If you're a business owner and you're going to get into business with someone, don't look at, just look at the balance sheet. Well, what do you live by? What's the morals of this company? What is, you, what, is, what is your take towards all these things? Because at some point, you're going to need to make a decision. We need to make decisions based on fruit. If you're single and you're here today, when you're looking for somebody to date, is it leaves? 
one, two, three, four, five, six packs of them. <laughs> Look at how beautiful her profile is. Look at how big his biceps are. Or do we say, whoa, 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 what's the fruit of that person's life? Just because they look good doesn't mean that they're going to be a godly partner for me. I need to make sure that they are plugged into God's house. Are they saved? They're not saved, but you know the Great Commission. Yeah, but, but, but do, they, do they give? Yeah, it's a work in progress. Look at the fruit of someone's life if you want to date them. Are they generous? Because if they're not generous before you start dating, I don't think they're going to be generous magically after you start dating. Are they plugged into church and do they serve? Because they're not going to serve in God's house one day. They're not going to be serving in your house. We need to make sure that we look at the fruit of a person's life and don't be enamored by leaves. Even when it comes to celebrities and people online, just because somebody can kick a ball really well or somebody can defend really well like Harry Maguire. <laughs> funny thing are the United supporters are laughing. It doesn't mean that we should follow their moral principles. Let them be good at sports, but you need to separate that from having a voice in your life. Just because you're good at something, just because you can act or sing, it doesn't mean that you give me moral guidance. God's word does. When we see, when we see people online, just because they say pastor or doctor or they've got a blue tick next to their name, it doesn't mean that that's who we should get advice from. Look at the fruit of their life, the fruit of the marriage, the fruit of their church, and make a decision based on fruit. Aren't you grateful for our senior pastors, Pastor Andre and Pastor Vilma, that there's fruit in their churches, there's fruit in their marriage, there's fruit in the campuses. Aren't you grateful for your lead pastors, Pastor Dean and Pastor Jeanette, that there's fruit in their marriage, that there's fruit in this campus, that even though we've been through a pandemic, they are still looking at ways to expand God's house, to expand the kingdom, to get more people in. You didn't walk in here after COVID and there was no roof all of a sudden. Or half the lights weren't working. That everything was here. We need to follow people based on their fruit. You don't need to go out of the church. You need to look inside it. Here for point number two. The gospel equals growth. Like you read in Genesis, it says that we need to be fruitful and multiply. Multiplication is the best form of growth. And as Christians, God has called us not just to have fruit, but also to grow. And Jesus also spoke in this when he was on the earth. And um, it says this in Matthew 25. It says, again, it'll be, it's a parable that Jesus is saying. Again, it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To the one he gave five bags of gold, to the other two bags, and to another one bag, according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags gained two more. But the man who received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. And what we need to understand is when we read that scripture, notice that the master, it's a picture of God, gave them everything they needed to grow. Their responsibility was to grow. In the same way God has given you and I everything we need to grow already, it's our responsibility to grow it. And notice the scripture says about the man with five bags. It says he took, the, he took it and immediately put it to work. Don't wait till tomorrow. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till after Easter. Start today to growing all the areas in our life. Because like I said, God's given us everything that we need. The problem is sometimes the environment around us stops it from growing. If you took a seed and you planted it and it didn't grow, chances are the seed is not at fault. It's the soil that it's in. Well, there's too much sunlight, not the dishwashing liquid. Or <laughs> well, there's too much water. What we need to do is we need to say, actually, maybe that's the, the issue in our life because the seed of the gospel is good seed. We need to make sure we are putting it in an, in an environment that will grow we need to make sure that our lives are in an environment where we will grow and will thrive. The church, the Bible tells us, those planted in the house of the Lord will flourish. If you want to grow in your life, be planted in God's house. And growth requires two things. It requires us to grow in all areas, not just on Sunday. But it also requires something called maturity. You see, so many of us, we got saved and we, and God came into our life and he changed our life. And like, I'm so glad I'm not where I used to be and we stopped there. God didn't just save you from your past. He saved us for a future that he has for you and I, a future that, that is bigger than we can even imagine, but it requires us to grow and it requires us to mature because growth requires maturity. 
For example, I, my wife and I don't have any kids, so the concept of babies are foreign to me because they don't make sense. Let me explain. If you have a baby, just, just extend some grace. So with a baby, they don't really talk. They don't really smile. I mean, the parents say, look, they're smiling. Meanwhile, the sunlight, again, from the sun, catches their eye and they do this. Like, oh, they're smiling. They're amazing. You're like. (laughs) Or they just kind of like babble some words. Like, wow, they're talking. I'm like, are they? You see, babies don't do much. They sleep, they eat, and they poop. Now, in a baby, it's cute and it's acceptable. But me at 30... That's all I did, and I was like, I'm smiling. You say you need to grow up, but you can't live in that space. As Christians, sometimes we get saved and we stop at baby, but God says, hey, you need to be children, and you need to grow past immature children into to men and women of God who have their beliefs firmly established. In Ephesians, it's put this way. It says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. You know, this is what Pastor Dean and Pastor Nett do is they build up the church. They build up our lives. And it says this, it goes on, it says, this will continue until we all come to such unity in the faith and knowledge of God's son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, then we will no longer be immature like children. You know that when we get plugged into church, that's where we mature. When we start serving, we start looking past ourselves and just what's happening around us. And we start looking at the bigger picture of God's church. We start looking at other people's lives. And when we serve others, our lives are then, uh, and then God rewards us in our life. Don't forget that Jesus said this, I didn't come to be served, but to serve. And if Jesus came to serve, you and I should find a way to serve. Because when we serve in God's house, we take responsibility for God's house. And it becomes not just the church, but our church. When you come under correction and leadership, it grows us and it matures us. When we sit under God's word, when we get into God's word, it begins to grow us and it begins to mature you and I. We need to make sure that we are finding ways to grow and we are finding ways to mature. And growth starts by this taking personal responsibility for your growth. Like I said, God's given us all, everything that we need to grow. But we need to take the responsibility to grow our finances, to grow our families, to grow our spiritual walk with God. It's not Pastor Dean and Pastor Dean, it's responsibility for you to grow in God. It's ours. We need to open the Bible and look at what the Bible says. We need to get plugged in and we need to grow and find ways to grow. And as we grow, as we bear fruit, we will see what the gospel should equal in our life. Is this helping anyone? You ready for point number three? The gospel equals lifestyle change. Some of you like, you said that already, right at the beginning. The gospel should result in life change in your life. Notice the point didn't say life change. It said the gospel equals lifestyle change. D.L. Moody put it this way. He said, the scriptures were not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. And do you know how we change our lives? It's by, uh, it's by looking at what the scripture says and actually applying it. The scripture in Colossians earlier said, um, in all wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and to please him in every way. You know that wisdom is knowing the difference between right and wrong? Some of you are like, is it really that simple? It's not simple, but that's what it is. Because when Solomon was asked by God, what do you want me to give you? He could have asked for anything. A Lamborghini. United to win. <laughs> Liverpool to win the, the Premier League. He could have asked for anything. You know what he said? He said, I need wisdom to guide and lead your people, God. I need wisdom to know the difference between right and wrong. And then... Once God gave him wisdom, it was his responsibility to apply it. And that's what understanding is. And as we read God's word, we know what is right and wrong. But then we need to have the wisdom to apply it. You see, everybody wants life change, but they're not willing to change their lifestyle to get it. The way it works is this, is God's changed your life from the cross. He did his part. 
our responsibility is the lifestyle change that we'll experience through Christ by applying his word day in and day, day out, week in and week out. And you know, lifestyle change starts with this one word. It's called repentance. It's not like a buzzword. No one is posting on Instagram, hashtag repentance. And if they are, they probably shouldn't be posting that. But here's the truth. Jesus, when he came to the, world, to the earth and he preached, his first preach was about repentance. He came to the earth for the, so that people would repent and turn back to God. Take a look what it says in Matthew 4, verse 17. From then on, Jesus began to preach, repent of your sin and turn to God for the kingdom of heaven is near. Jesus' first preach could have been anything. Be nice to people. Stay in school. Don't do drugs. Listen to the hospitality team. Don't book for a service and then not come. He could have said anything. But he says, repent from your sins and turn to God. And that's what you and I need to do. Some people might think, well, when Jesus sat with the sinners and the tax collectors, he never asked them to repent. He just loved everyone. Well, let's take an account from one of the tax collectors. In Luke 5, when Jesus is sitting with a man named Levi, who you and I know is Matthew, the gospel writer, it says this, later Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them, but the Pharisees and the teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Can I just pause? Be careful what people say to you about your leadership and about the church. Notice they didn't go to Jesus because they knew that Jesus would give them the Will Smith answer, slap across the face. <laughs> Look at what it says. It says, Jesus answered them, healthy people do not need a doctor. Sick people do. I have, not come, to call, I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. This is Jesus sitting with sinners and tax collectors reminding them that you need to repent. And notice, we need to understand the Bible says all have fallen short and all are sinners. You and I, were all sinners, which means we need God's grace, God's love, but he gives that to us. What we need to do in response is to repent for ourselves. And then you might think, yeah, but this is all before the cross, Jesus. I mean, before Jesus went to the cross, Chris, what happens after the cross is you don't need to repent because, you know, he's dealt with your sin and shame. Well, take a look what Jesus says after the cross in Luke. Then he opened their minds to understanding the scripture and said to them, thus it is written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance from the forgiveness of sin should be proclaimed in his name to all nations. Everyone say all. Beginning from Jerusalem. It could have said some nations. It could have said a few nations, but it's all nations because all have fallen short, you and me included, which means that we need to repent to God. Repentance is not, as much as God knows what we've done, repentance is more for us than it is for God. It reminds us of what we need to yield in our life, the areas we need to stop in our life and look back and focus on God. You know that the Greek word for repentance is this, metanoia. It's broken into two words. The word meta is a change of direction or movement. And the word noia means thoughts, pre perceptions, dispositions, and purposes. So in essence, when we repent, what we're doing is we are changing our movement, we are changing our direction in our thoughts, our perceptions, our dispositions, what we identify with, what we lean with, and we're saying, I'm taking all of that away and I'm gonna focus on God's word, his truth, the grace that empowers me, the word of God that guides me, the church that comes around me, and I'm going to repent and I'm gonna focus on that because it's a decision that when we say it with our mouth, it changes us from the outside in. You know, we, we begin to repent by verbalizing it, but then God begins to do something in our lives. And today as we're in this service, as we are trusting God and we're looking at the gospel and the good news, maybe you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Maybe uh, you got invited, maybe somebody tricked you into coming to church, but you're here and it's not by accident. Because like Jesus says in Matthew, 
repent of your sins and turn to God. I'm gonna give you an opportunity right now to turn to God and say, you know, I don't have life figured out. I'm not gonna delude myself in thinking that my righteousness is enough because I know that I need God and I need Christ as my savior. So if that's you, you've never had an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. I'm gonna pray for you in a moment. Or maybe you used to walk with God, but you stopped repenting. You didn't have the fruit of life change. You stopped growing and you fell away from God. And you're sitting here today and you realize I need to come back to Him. If that's you and you're in one of those two groups of people, while every eye is closed, every head's bowed, we wanna give people their privacy. But this is a special moment. If you're a believer, start praying quietly under your breath for people. If you've never said yes to God or you wanna turn back to Him, just raise your hand so I can see you and I can lead you in a prayer. You know, many people have made this decision before. I see that hand, that's an amazing decision. I'm looking up on the balcony, down on the ground, I see that hand, it's an amazing decision. See that hand. Don't wait till later. Don't wait till next week. I see that hand. Make a decision today. Say, God, I know I'm not perfect, but I'm trusting you. I see that hand, I see that hand. That's amazing. On the balcony, on the ground, see there's some hands going up everywhere. What an amazing decision that you're making. What we're gonna do now is I'm gonna lead you in a prayer. I'll say the words, and if you put your hand up, you can repeat after me, but don't worry, it's not just gonna be you. We are the family of God. We're all gonna stand together and pray like this. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Today, I repent of my sins. I invite you, Jesus, into my life and into my heart. I believe that you are Lord and Savior. Take the sin, the guilt, and the shame and give me your future, your plan, and purpose. Help me grow, bear fruit, and change my life. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you made that decision, people are clacking, clapping not just because they're, they're glad that the message is over and it's done with, but they're clapping because your eternity has been forever changed. That your, your eternity is secure in heaven and you can live life differently and we wanna help you on that journey. So as you head out the building, there's salvation packs available at the info counter. Grab one, it'll answer any questions you might have and it'll give us a way of connecting you with you and helping you along this journey. Well, church, hope that you've um, enjoyed the service today. Hope that it's been beneficial and that it's helped you. As you head out, don't forget you can drop your offering in the box on the way out. And we love you and we'll see you next week.